Hello, and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Can a bad leader, or even a bad person, still deserve credit for achieving good results? What if they never even cared about achieving those results in the first place? Genghis Khan is a good example. Right? Over the course of his careers and his conquests, Genghis Khan killed about 40 million people. And to put that in perspective, that's about twice as many people as Adolf Hitler. And it was at a time when 40 million people was 10% of the world's population. In terms of the proportion of the human race uh, killed, Genghis Khan is the greatest murderer in all of history, bar none. But he gets all kinds of credit for all kinds of things, right? He gets credit for reestablishing trade over land between Europe and China, for example. His descendants actually end up becoming a legitimate Chinese dynasty. Other descendants have other dynasties elsewhere throughout Asia. He has all kinds of cultural impact and is at least a major figure, if not a founding father to more than one society. There are statues of him and postage stamps with his picture on them in Mongolia. If you want to look at another example of a bad person still getting credit for achieving good results, how about Julius Caesar and his conquest of Gaul, right? The territory of modern-day France. Well, he expanded the Roman Empire, he doubled the spread of Latin culture in a single generation, but in the process he killed a whole lot of people. And, by the way, he was doing it for the glory of Caesar. Not exactly the most noble of motives. Well, today we'll be talking about a slightly less bloodthirsty figure, but Nonetheless, one who is often portrayed as a terrible leader in popular culture. And that person is none other than the English King John. And here is how 19th century British historian William Stubbs describes John. He says, quote, John had made private enemies as well as public ones. He trusted no man, and no man trusted him. The threat of deposition aroused all his fears, and he betrayed his apprehensions in the way usual with tyrants. John was the worst of all our kings, a faithless son and a treacherous brother, polluted with every crime. In the whole view, there is no redeeming trait. Unquote. And yet, despite being arguably the worst king that England ever had, John would also be the first to sign the Magna Carta. This is a document that forms the foundation of what would grow eventually into the idea of constitutional monarchy. The idea that even though someone is a king or a queen of a territory, that they are not above the law. That there are specific limitations to their power. Now, this idea is not entirely unique in history, it would be unfair to say that the Magna Carta is some entirely original document, but as the foundation of English law, it would be exported to much of the world. This makes it arguably uh, 
one of the most important documents in history. So who is King John? Who is this guy who signed the Magna Carta? Well, John is the son of the former King Henry, and he is the younger brother of Richard the Lionheart. We just did four episodes on him. Now, before becoming king, John spends most of his adult life trying to usurp Richard in one way or another. And while during Richard's lifetime, John never gets to be king, upon Richard's death from a crossbow wound in 1199, John finally gets his wish. He inherits his brother's lands, which are collectively known to history as the Angevin Empire. All right, in addition to England, this land includes much of modern-day France, basically the western half, more or less. And he holds all of these lands in France, not as a king, but via a handful of separate titles where he is duke of a handful of territories. And in this role as duke, he is at least officially a vassal of the French King Philip. So in England, John is now going to be on top of the totem pole, but in his French lands, at least officially, he has to defer to the French king. Feudalism is complicated, and in this case, those complications are not in John's advantage. See, there has been, for the last couple of generations now, a family conflict, a dynastic struggle between Philip's family, the House of Capet, and John's family, the House of Plantagenet, over control for France. And this is the situation that John inherits when he is crowned King of England at Westminster Abbey in May of the year 1199. So, to secure his claims as well as possible, John's 77-year-old mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, goes on a goodwill tour of all of his French territories. She gives away a bunch of land to the local nobles. She gives various people special trade privileges and essentially any favors she can give out. Well, why the sudden publicity to her now? Well, as it turns out, John is not just inheriting a a sort of general, broad, dynastic struggle that's been going on for generations— He is inheriting a situation where he is not the only person with a claim to some of these territories. See, a handful of French nobles are not supporting John. They are supporting his nephew, Arthur. Arthur is a younger man who had been Richard's heir in the past, Several years before, Richard and John had had a falling out, and Richard had made Arthur his heir for a period of time. And while Richard had ultimately reversed himself and acknowledged John as his heir before his death, for a variety of reasons, a handful of French nobles are still going to back Arthur, and... These nobles include most of the leading men of the Duchy of Brittany. That is the very far western part of France. And that's where Arthur himself is the duke. Well, this is really good news for French King Philip, right? Here he's had this dynastic struggle with the Plantagenets, and uh, all of a sudden his rival Richard has died. There's this new King John, and uh, 
Some of the nobles aren't supporting John. Well, what a great deal for Philip. What a great time for him to try and make friends with Arthur. And that's what he does. He invites Arthur to Paris where he throws him a bunch of parties and he offers Arthur control over all of King Richard's former land in continental Europe. And if he can't control this land directly by himself, well, maybe Philip can at least get John out of that land and push him back to England and have Arthur running these lands on the European continent instead. Then he can maybe divide and conquer at his leisure. So it looks as if the two sides are bound for war, right? And, in fact, John musters an army, Philip musters an army, and the two forces square off in France, but neither side can really be sure of victory. Essentially, they're evenly matched. So, early in the year 1200, John and Philip agree to make peace. The agreement is that John will abandon Richard's policy of independence. Richard had been fighting against Philip at the time of his death and had wanted to run all of his French land independently. Well, John is officially not going to follow that policy. He swears fealty to Philip officially, uh, at least in the context of his roles as Duke of these various French territories. And in return... Philip recognizes his claims. Basically, they're both saying, hey, we're going to accept the status quo here and we're not going to go to war. But as happens a few times during his life, John manages to take a good thing, or at least a functional thing, and completely break it. In this case, in August of the year 1200, just seven months after the outbreak of peace, he decides that he's going to divorce his wife, Isabella. And he's able to obtain an annulment very easily on the grounds that they are first cousins and never should have been married in the first place. Now, this is kind of ironic because he had needed a dispensation from a bishop to get married to her in the first place, and in fact, the two were forbidden by the church from having sexual relations. But nonetheless, the dissolution of this interesting marriage makes the nobles in Gloucester angry. This area of Gloucester in England is where Isabella is from, and her family and a lot of her friends are very upset at John for annulling the marriage. But what is almost as baffling is John's choice of a new bride. He is now engaging himself to a woman named Isabella of Angoulême. She's an important noble woman in the Poitou region of France. Now, This region is one of the parts of France that is kind of sort of barely in John's control. If you listened to the last episode, this is the region where Richard had died about a year before putting down a rebellion. So, On its face, it makes sense that John would want to get married to a noblewoman from the area, try and shore up local relationships, but Isabella of Angoulême is already engaged, and she's engaged to a man named Hugh X of Lusignan. Well, the Lusignan family have been close allies with John's family, the Plantagenets, for a couple of generations. Guy de Lusignan, Hugh's uncle, had been one of Richard's key supporters during the Crusades. Well, in one fell swoop, John has now not only alienated some of these nobles at home from Gloucester, right, because he divorced his old wife, but now he's angered 
an important family in a region that is prone to rebellion. Bravo, John. And a number of the historians from the time seem to suggest that John is mostly doing this because Isabella of Anjoulême is stunningly beautiful and he just wants to marry her for himself. How much of this is true and how much of this is historians sort of piling on King John is a little bit harder to say. Uh, It does seem that Isabella herself seems to have been okay with the change in arrangements. She's a bit of a social climber. And uh, John, for all of whatever flaws he has, he is, after all, a king. And Hugh is just sort of a middle-ranking nobleman, you know, not really that all of an exciting husband. Her former fiancé might just have something to say about all this. See, Hugh might be a vassal of John's, right? He may owe him loyalty, and under the current system, John even technically has the right to break his engagement and engage himself to Isabella. But John, as the Count of Poitou, right, as Hugh's liege lord is a vassal of Philip's. This is a quirk of the feudal system. If John had gone and taken the fiancé of one of his English lords, there wouldn't have been much that guy could do about it, but instead he messes with one of his French vassals, and what Hugh can do and what Hugh does do is go directly to Philip, the king, and appeal John's decision. Now, Philip is just loving this. Uh, Any opportunity to embarrass the king of England, right? So he calls John to come to Paris and present his side of the case. Well, when John refuses, Philip declares that John has violated his oaths and that his lands in France are forfeit. Once again, Philip decides he's going to bestow these lands on Arthur. So that war that almost started in 1200 and didn't, now it starts two years later in 1202. And when this war starts, John actually does pretty well at first. In July of 1202, he finds out that a castle where his mother Eleanor is staying is about to be put under siege. And it's about to be put under siege by none other than Arthur himself. So he makes a lightning-forced march across Normandy and reaches Arthur's army as they are sitting and having lunch. And he very easily captures Arthur along with 250 knights and leads them in chains back across France and then into England and parades them around to put them on display. But once again, John manages to make enemies out of his allies. And he already managed to start a war for no reason, Well, now Arthur mysteriously dies in prison. So I shouldn't be entirely unfair. We don't know 100% for sure that John had Arthur killed. It's just really suspicious timing, you know, that he captures his big rival for control of these French territories, and oops, the guy just died in prison. What do you know? Well, as you might imagine, this does not exactly escape the notice of people at the time, and in April of the year 1203, the next spring, when King John returns from England to Normandy, he finds that word of Arthur's death 
Arthur's very, very suspicious death has already preceded him. Here is what contemporary historian Roger of Wendover says about these rumors. Quote, On his arrival there, an opinion about the death of Arthur gained ground throughout the French kingdom and the continent in general, by which it seemed that John was suspected by all of having slain him with his own hand, for which reason many turned their affections from the king from that time forward, wherever they dared, and entertained the deepest enmity against him. Unquote. Okay, so there's this rumor going around, right? But Surely some of the nobles will stand with John anyway, right? There are local politics going on, and a bunch of them just plain don't like Philip. So what do they care? Well, it seems that John is just unwilling to defend his own nobles at this point. He has brought a large force of English knights with him to Normandy, but he's not actually using them. Roger of Wendover continues, quote, At length, messengers came to King John with the news, saying, The king of the French has entered your territories as an enemy, has taken such and such castles, carries off the governors of them ignominiously bound to their horses' tails, and disposes of your property at will without anyone gainsaying him. In reply to this news, King John said, Let him do so. Whatever he now seizes on, I will one day recover. And neither these messengers nor others who brought him the like news could obtain any other answer. But the earls and barons and other nobles of the kingdom of England, who had till that time firmly adhered to him, when they heard his words and saw his incorrigible idleness, obtained his permission and returned home, pretending that they would come back to him and so left the king with only a few soldiers in Normandy. Unquote. Astoundingly, it seems as if John is spending most of his time in bed with Isabella during this time. He's like a kid who became a rock star, hooked up with a supermodel, and forgot about the music, right? And... It is in the nature of historians of these times that oftentimes women get short shrift. So it's tough to say how much of all of this didn't just happen because John just could not control himself somehow around this beautiful woman. But for whatever reason, it seems as if he is spending most of his time with her and not doing anything about this war and... Over the course of 1203 to 1204, John manages to lose almost all of his lands in France. Outside of England, the only land he now rules is Aquitaine, the southwestern part of France that he inherited from his mother, Eleanor. Yet, even so, he seems to be serious about retaking everything. He repeatedly levies new taxes to build up the royal treasury. Now, this irritates the nobles even more. Now, for one thing, you might think, well, of course, nobody wants to pay taxes, and there are very few politicians who become popular with people by telling them, hey, your taxes are going up, but this isn't what we would understand today as, like, libertarian low-tax sentiment or something like that. This is because the nobles are paying taxes under a system called scutage. Scutage in the feudal system, right, in the legal tradition in which these people are living, it is a payment that a feudal lord makes to his overlord instead of providing soldiers. It is specifically a wartime tax. It's based on the principle that when a feudal lord or a king goes to war, he has the right to call on his vassals for help, and if you know the vassal can't help because they don't have enough men or because it's harvest time or for whatever reason, 
Uh, instead, they can send some money and their overlord can use that money to hire some mercenaries or otherwise help out with the war. The problem is that, as we've already kind of discussed, John is not actually waging any war. He's just sort of sitting there, letting his subordinates fend for themselves. So it's understandable why these nobles are a little upset about having to repeatedly pay scutage when John doesn't seem to actually be doing anything with it. So by now, it's the year 1205. John has been king for about six years, in that time, he's managed to lose pretty much all his French territory and now is alienating most of his nobles by raising war taxes that he's not doing anything with. How could he possibly worsen this situation? Well, he decides he's going to pick a fight with the Pope. And remember, these are very religious times. Most of his subjects from the most important to, you know, your everyday peasants in the society, they're very religious people. And so the relationship between their king and the head of their religion is very important. Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury has just died. This is the most important member of the church in England. And John goes ahead and appoints his own replacement for the archbishop, a man named John de Grey. Well, there is a monastery at Canterbury, and some monks there protest. They claim that they have the right to nominate the new archbishop, and they put forward a guy named Reginald. And they decide they're going to go take their case to the pope, uh, to Pope Innocent III in Rome, and uh, get uh, him to put Reginald in as archbishop. But Innocent is furious with both John and the monks. He insists that as pope, only he can appoint a new archbishop. So he rejects both John de Grey and Reginald and appoints his own candidate, a churchman named Stephen Langton. And he makes that appointment in the year 1207. Remember, these are medieval times. It does take a couple of years for this whole process to play out. Well, John does not accept the Pope's appointment. Instead, he goes and he seizes all the property belonging to the Archbishopric of Canterbury. Right, Anything that belongs to that title that comes with it has now been seized by the king. John declares Langton a traitor, and he actually threatens to deny the use of English ports to papal ships. In 1208, Pope Innocent uses the medieval equivalent of the nuclear option, and... It's a special kind of nuclear option that only the Pope can use. He places all of England under interdict. Now let me explain what that means. We talk a lot on this show about how people used to be a lot more religious back in the day. And as a result, in medieval Europe in particular... A whole lot of everyday services and functions were performed by the Catholic Church. Without the Church, you couldn't get married. You couldn't have your marriage annulled, for that matter. Without the Church, you couldn't be buried. At least not in a consecrated graveyard, which was extremely important back in these days. Right. You would see people in legal cases willing to accept more extreme punishments sometimes if it meant they could avoid being buried in unhallowed ground. So, 
when the Pope places England under interdict, he is denying use of all of the church's services to everybody in the country. Masses cannot be celebrated. Baptisms can't be performed. You could go on and on and on with all of these things that were very, very important to the people of this time that the Pope just sort of takes away from them. If you were a leader and the Pope put your country under interdict, you better have a really good reason not to get right with him because your people are going to be very, very upset with you. And it's almost amazing that John manages to hold on to his throne for as long as he does, but he is isolated in England, and to maintain funding, he launches a series of wars to put down local rebellions. He goes to war against Scotland in 1209. He goes to war against some lower-ranking lords in Ireland in 1210, and he does the same with the Welsh in 1211. And he actually does pretty well in all three of these campaigns. Uh, each time he is able to exact a lot of monetary tribute from the defeated enemies, uh, so he's able to continue funding his armies and building his treasury. And... John's conflict with Wales, in particular, is one of the few bright points in his reign, depending on how you look at things, at least. Uh, the Welsh princes never fully recovered from their defeat by John in 1211, and his grandson, Edward, would ultimately incorporate Wales fully into the English kingdom before the end of the century. Now, these victories, as well as more taxes and levies, have allowed John to build and maintain enough of a mercenary army that no one in the British Isles is willing to challenge his role, interdict or not. He uses mercenaries, mostly from Germany and Denmark, because he does not trust any of his own lords and any troops they could provide. And by the year 1212, John has not only assembled this fairly large army, but he has managed to continue building his treasury while doing so, so he's prepared to launch a campaign into France. But information comes to light he discovers that there is a plot against his life. So, unsure of whom he can trust, rather than go ahead with the invasion, John disbands his army. This is not quite clear why he would do that. I mean, his army is relying on him for pay, and by disbanding them, he now has to trust to his lords, who he already didn't trust, but what can we say? John seems to be a little bit paranoid, perhaps. And in early 1213, the next year, John learns that King Philip of France was actually the one behind his attempted assassination. It had nothing to do with his mercenaries. Meanwhile, by this time, in 1213, Philip himself has put together a fleet to invade England. And now, John has to try and defend England with a relatively small army. He marches this army to the expected landing point of Philip's fleet. Uh, he's badly outnumbered and would rather not fight, and... Before battle is joined, he scores a diplomatic coup. John surrenders. But he doesn't surrender to Philip. John surrenders the Kingdom of England to the Pope. He agrees to pay an annual tribute of a thousand marks. And amazingly, this works. Pope Innocent uh, 
raises the interdict on England, and not only that, but he allows John to appoint whatever church officials he wants to. And without any religious backing or excuse for his invasion, Philip backs off. John is able to afford this tribute to the Pope without a whole lot of trouble because he has amassed a huge sum of money. He has collected over 200,000 silver marks over the last several years. Now, it's difficult dealing with old-time money, especially when that money is silver because you have to deal with metal inflation and different sizes of coin in different places. It's hard to nail down exactly how much money John has, but it's about half of all the money in England at the time. With this much money, he funds a new army, and he builds a fleet of his own. In May of 1213, this English fleet burns Philip's French fleet at anchor, which effectively ends the threat of invasion for good. This emboldens John to finally make good on his promise to retake his lost territory. So he leads his invasion fleet across the English Channel to Normandy and lays siege to the strategically important castle of roche am Now, Philip has to simultaneously fight against John and repel an invasion from the Holy Roman Empire on the other side of his kingdom. So, while Philip is off dealing with the Holy Roman Imperial troops, he sends his son Louis to repel John's army. Now, Philip has had to split his forces, and John's army is pretty big. John's besieging army at Rochamoine outnumbers Louis's force. But John retreats despite his superior numbers. He can't rely, or at least he doesn't think he can rely, on all of his army. A lot of the troops he has with him are from Poitou. That is the region where he took Isabella from her fiancé, so he can't necessarily rely on these people. But he can't help but think that a bolder king would have tried. Instead, on July 3rd of 1214, John's army crosses the Loire River back into Aquitaine. In the process, many of his rear guard are either scattered or killed. But Louis has only won a battle for France. He hasn't won the war. John could still win. The Holy Roman Empire could still win. But after the retreat, John's imperial and Flemish allies are defeated in battle on July 27th a little over three weeks later. In this battle, called the Battle of Bouvan, Philip kills over 160 knights and captures more than 130. This invasion by the Holy Roman Empire has been crushed, and Philip is able to turn his entire army now towards John. Upon receiving word of this defeat, John is forced to sue for peace. Philip accepts John's surrender, but the terms are harsh. John must pay a penalty of 40,000 pounds. That's millions to low billions of dollars in today's money. And John is to officially lose all of his French territory, with the exception of Gascony, which is a 
part of Aquitaine. So now after this invasion, 14 years after taking the throne, John returns to England in disgrace. He is, rather than taking back his land, actually managed to lose more. But either he's just really tenacious, or he lacks the self-awareness to know when he is beaten. And almost immediately, he tries to levy yet another tax to fund another invasion. And this is finally too much for his nobles to stomach. So, during Christmas week of 1214, a group of nobles come to John and give him what amounts to an ultimatum. They demand that he sign a royal charter. A charter being when a ruler grants a set of rights to some various people. And this in itself is nothing new. Royal charters have been around almost as long as the idea of royalty itself. The first documented royal charter dates all the way back to Cyrus the Great of Persia, who in the 530s BC granted a whole bunch of rights to a bunch of local people in his empire, including the ancient Israelites. And in fact, Charters were not even something particularly new in recent English history. John's predecessor, Henry I, had issued a charter of his own called the Charter of Liberties way back in the year 1100, so a little over a hundred years before our story. And this charter had included a number of checks on royal power, basically guaranteed uh, some certain rights for the Nobility, and this is the charter that the barons want to have enforced. Primarily, they're interested in the issues of taxation and inheritance, and not constantly being threatened with the loss of their titles if they don't ante up one more of John's war levies. And John realizes that he's in a bit of a pickle, he can't exactly refuse these nobles right to their face, so he asks to delay a little bit until spring, until Easter. He says he needs some time so he can have his scholars look over the original charter and make sure everything is squared away properly and legally, but what he's really trying to do is buy some time so he can raise an army. But the barons preempt him. See, before John has the opportunity to act, a group of nobles seize the city of London itself. And they do so without bloodshed. And then they send messages around to all of the nobles who are still supporting John and say, hey, look, we took over London. We're in charge of the country now. And... At that point, a whole bunch of John's allies defect. Essentially, all it took was for someone to take over London, and uh, they were willing to jump ship. So, outmaneuvered, John is forced to sign the Baron's Charter on June 15th, 1215. This charter is now known as the Great Charter, the Magna Carta. And while, well, as we'll see, it's evolved over time, this date of June 15th, 1215, is normally considered the official day of the Magna Carta's signing. Now, the original Charter of Liberties of Henry I consists of 14 declarations, none of which is longer than a few sentences. The Magna Carta, on the other hand, the charter that John is signing, it's over 4,400 words long. It's about the same length as the unamended U.S. Constitution. And much like the U.S. Constitution, it's mostly very dry. It's after all, a legal document, so I won't read the whole thing. Uh, 
And I'm no expert on British constitutional law. Right? If you want to break that document down clause by clause and talk about why everything is important and how that affects things in England today, there are plenty of people who are far more qualified to discuss that. But I did study political science, and I understand how laws are written and how precedent is developed. Right? We have, well, we, uh, I live in the U.S., but we in the common law system inherited from Great Britain, we have a system of precedent. So if there's no statute on the books uh, when a case has to be decided, a judge looks at how similar cases have been ruled in the past. Even if there is a law on the books, judges will look to previous cases to see how they should interpret that law. And the Magna Carta establishes a whole bunch of precedents, right? things that we now take for granted today. Basic principles of constitutional government. Well, what are some of these principles? And for that, we can look to one of the major uh, texts in the British legal tradition, uh, Sir William Blackstone's classic 18th century uh, Commentaries on the Laws of England. This book is commonly taught in British law schools, and what Blackstone says is this. He says that, among other things, the Magna Carta establishes three fundamental rights. Right? Those are the rights to life, liberty, and property. These rights, he says, are derived from Clause 37 of the Magna Carta. I, I am going to read that part. It says, quote, No free man is to be arrested, imprisoned, or dispossessed, or outlawed or exiled, or in any other way ruined, nor will we go against him or send against him, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Unquote. And from these three fundamental rights of life, liberty, and property, Blackstone goes on and he identifies three additional principles that need to be respected if the rights to life, liberty, and property are to be protected. And these principles are the rights and privileges of Parliament, the limitation of royal power, and the right of citizens of access to courts. And this last is derived from Clause 40, which says, To no man will we sell or delay or deny justice. And when you look at a document like this, right, those things sound pretty fundamental today, right? The government of your U.S. state, for example, uh, can't just arrest you and throw you in prison without uh, charging you of breaking some law and actually taking you to court and making a case, right? But in medieval times, this was by no means a given, and by putting all this down in writing, the nobles and King John established a precedent. But let's remember that while this document is idealistic for the times, the people who signed it all signed it for personal political reasons. From what we can tell, King John is not some great humanitarian here. He's a politician who has been backed into a corner and knows when he's beaten. Conversely, the nobles who put forward this entire document, uh, most of their concerns are about the rights of people of their own class. I just cited a couple of clauses out of many. And most of the other clauses apply to the interests of the nobility and inheritance. The one other major advance, and one that's often overlooked, is that the Magna Carta also marks somewhat of an advance for women's rights. 
there is a clause that states that a widowed woman cannot be forced to remarry against her will, which prior to this in England she could be. So there you have it, something else the Magna Carta did. But again, this was not done out of any idealism. This was nobles tired of people like King John breaking up their marriages and that sort of thing. It just happened to have a benefit for a great many more people going forward. And if you need any more evidence that you know, all of the people who signed the Magna Carta were really only doing it for their own self-interest, how about the fact that the original only lasted about as long as it took for the ink to dry? As soon as John signs this famous document on June 15, 1215, at Runnymede Stream near London, he disappears to the Isle of Wight, one of the farthest reaches of his domain, and there he sets about hiring mercenaries, again to raise an army, and he sends an emissary to the Pope, and remember the Pope is John's friend now, one of his few friends, he sends an emissary to the Pope protesting the Magna Carta and saying that he only signed it under duress. And here's how Roger of Wendover describes this time period. He says, quote, He himself in the meantime, with a few followers whom he had begged from the retinue of the Bishop of Norwich, took on himself the business of a pirate and employed himself in gaining the goodwill of the sailors of the Sank Ports. And thus, hiding as it were in the open air in the island and near the sea coasts, without any regal show, he for three months led a solitary life on the water and in the company of sailors, for he preferred to die rather than to live long unrevenged for the insults of the barons. All this time, different reports were circulated by different people concerning him, and by some he was said to have turned fisherman, and by others a traitor and a pirate and by some he was said to have become an apostate. And after he had been, on account of his protracted absence, sought for by several without success, they believed that he was drowned or had perished in some other way. The king, however, bore all these reports with equanimity, awaiting the expected arrival of his messengers, some of whom he had sent to the court of Rome and others to raise troops to assist him. Unquote. End John turns out to have been well advised to reach out to the Pope. See, in September of 2015, letters arrive denouncing the nobles as rebels and excommunicating them, right? Cutting them off from the Catholic Church and church services. Basically, the Pope's way of saying that they had better get back in line behind John. And at the same time, John reveals himself and returns to England with his army. And in response, the nobles send a message of their own. They reach out to Louis, the son of King Philip of France, and they offer Prince Louis the English throne if he will come over and help them to fight off John. Now, Louis doesn't come over right away. First, he sends over some knights to help garrison London, and John, meanwhile, campaigns around in the north of England, a little bit away from London, but what he's doing up there is subjugating one rebel baron after another, taking one castle after another, and collecting tribute, and crushing this rebellion piece by piece, and letting the nobles in London just sort of sit there. While he does all this, well, Louis eventually does arrive in London and enters the city unopposed to the cheers of many of these nobles. Unfortunately, we will never find out what would have happened if John and Louis had come to blows because even as he is up in the north subjugating this rebellion, on October 19th, 1216, John succumbs 
to dysentery after just a few days of illness at the age of 49. Perhaps an appropriate end for a man who spent most of his life defecating on his brother's legacy. Roger of Wendover says, quote, King John reigned 18 years, 5 months, and 5 days, during which time he caused many disturbances and entered on many useless labors in the world, and at length departed this life in great agony of mind, possessed of no territory, yea, not even being his own master. Unquote. And yet another example of what some contemporary English folks thought about John, the Barnwell Abbey Chronicle says, quote, He was generous and liberal to outsiders, but stole from the English. Since he trusted more in foreigners than in the English, he had been abandoned before the end by his people, and his own end was little mourned. Unquote. And in that quote, keep in mind that those outsiders are German and Danish mercenaries. Right? By contrast, the nobles candidate, Louis, uh, despite being the French prince, is a fellow Norman. He shares the same language and customs as the English nobles. And this French prince is not yet considered a foreigner in London. In fact, the English spoken by the common people in these times would not even be recognizable to most modern English speakers. And the Magna Carta itself is written in Latin. It's a little bit of a different story from today's age when England and France are very different places. Even so, without King John to unite them against him, the barons are less willing to back Louis. Uh, most of them are coalescing around John's young son, Henry III, who's only nine years old. And that helps, because they don't have to accept a king right away. They can back Henry III as this figurehead who's going to grow up someday. And in the meantime... Acting as Henry's regent is a Norman-Irish lord named William Marshall. And this is a lord who has a little bit of credibility with both sides. He had been loyal to John during this rebellion, but he had fought with John in the past during John's battles in Ireland. So he had a little bit of uh, credibility with both sides. And... Now, with a majority of English nobles backing Henry III and his regent William Marshall, Louis is soon driven from England. He doesn't have enough support to stay there. And the two groups of nobles in England make peace. And as part of the peace process, William Marshall, in Henry III's name reaffirms the Magna Carta. And there are some significant revisions. Uh, he adds a major document called the Charter of the Forest, which enumerates some additional rights, uh, mostly relating to land use. And over time, those two documents together would collectively come to be called the Magna Carta. And in fact, the document would continue to evolve. There would be another version proclaimed in 1225, and again, uh, 72 years later in 1297. And it's actually the 1297 version that is still the official version. And going even further, every single clause has since either been rewritten or eliminated, but hey, it's been 724 years. Even so, the Magna Carta remains a foundational text not just for England and later the United Kingdom, but for many countries throughout the world. Over 40 countries 
have legal systems which are based in whole or in part on English common law. These include India, the world's second largest country by population, includes all the Commonwealth nations, Australia, New Zealand, and even most of Britain's old African colonies have kept the common law system, and so have 49 U.S. states and nine Canadian provinces, the exceptions in the New World being Louisiana and Quebec, which use Napoleonic law instead. And because the Magna Carta is this foundational text for so many people, it continues to be relevant to this day, and it continues to be cited. Just to use one example, in 2008, the U.S. Supreme Court was asked to consider whether certain prisoners' rights were being violated uh, when they were detained at the uh, military detention camp at Guantanamo Bay. And in the majority decision, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote, quote, Magna Carta decreed that no man would be imprisoned contrary to the law of the land, unquote. before going on to rule that several prisoners had indeed been unlawfully detained. So, as old as it was, and as flawed as the people who signed it, the Magna Carta continues to resonate. And what about our original question? Right. The way we started today's episode. Can a terrible leader, or even a terrible human, achieve something great and deserve credit? What about John? Was he actually a terrible king? Was he a terrible human? And does he deserve any credit? Well, you know, for the first question, was he a terrible king? Well, as bad as his reputation is, I would argue not really. John made some serious blunders, to be sure. Certainly was not wise of him to pick a fight with the Pope, for instance, when he was trying to retake his French territories already. He also made some cowardly decisions. Right? He abandoned the siege of roche aux moines without even trying to fight it out. But John also had some victories. He captured his nephew Arthur bloodlessly, came up on his army eating lunch in a brilliant move, and ironically this probably would have been more famous if there had been a battle and a whole bunch of people had died, but hey, when you can win without fighting, even better, and it's just not the kind of thing medieval bards were writing ballads about. And John did keep England together, at least, right? During a difficult time, he lost a lot of territory. He lost, well, much of the Angevin Empire, most of his French land. But he actually gained land and influence for the crown within the British Isles. That's important if you're thinking about how Britain, well, first England and then Britain, evolved after that. So I don't know if it's fair to say he was a terrible king. Poor to mediocre, but not terrible. Well, was he a good person? To that I would answer not just no, but hell no. John spent most of his life grasping for power. He treated his war prisoners horribly. A number of them starved. He violated multiple treaties and oaths. And he almost certainly had his own nephew murdered. But great men are oftentimes not good men. Just to use a... Example that's very close to John, John's older brother, Richard the Lionheart, massacred 2,700 Muslim prisoners in a single morning, just so he wouldn't have to feed them. Most people don't consider him a monster. 
not even the Muslim chroniclers of the time make a huge deal out of the event. They're upset about it, but it's the kind of thing that happens in warfare at the time. So John wasn't a good person, but I don't know that that necessarily would have disqualified him from being a good king. If anything, he seems to have failed because of his personality. He didn't trust others. He wasn't trustworthy himself. Again, that siege at Rochamois, where he abandoned the siege without even fighting because Louis was on the way and he couldn't trust his own allies. Well, if he's just a little bit more trustworthy and builds bridges instead of burning them, maybe he can trust those allies and he can stay at that battle and he can win and he forges a new empire and he's on coins and postage stamps today. Instead, he's widely regarded as the worst king of England and as the subject of one of the less well-loved Shakespeare plays. And largely, I would argue, it's because of his personality and his inability to build relationships. But does he deserve any credit for the Magna Carta? Well, why would he? John died fighting against it. If anyone deserves credit... It's William Marshall. And even he was reissuing the Magna Carta as part of a political deal. But whatever you think of him as a king or as a person, or whether or not you think he deserves credit for anything, after John's reign, England and France would forever be separate countries. The House of Capet... William and Louis' family would rule France until the French Revolution. In England, a series of dynasties, the houses of Plantagenet and Tudor and Stuart and Hanover and Saxe Coburg and Gotha and Windsor, in turn, they would all rule a country bound by the rule of law. And as time went on, by fits and starts, those leaders would be bound ever more tightly. And that was a process that began with the Magna Carta. And beyond that, beyond the history of one country, the idea of a sovereign government bound by the rule of law and by its citizens' rights, well, that idea has spread throughout the world. And that's why it's relevant. Hello again, it's Dan, and I'm here to ask for your help. See, we're trying to promote this show and get the word out to as many people as possible, so if you have a minute, please share on your favorite social media. Send a link to the episode or even to our website at dantollerpodcast.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. If this is your first time listening to the show... Don't miss a future episode. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, Google, Spotify, or just about any other service you want to listen to a podcast on. You can find an RSS link as well as a link to all these other services, again, at dantollerpodcast.com. If you want news on the latest episodes or anything that is upcoming in the world of relevant history, 
You can find us at Dan Toller Podcast on Twitter or at Dan Toller on Facebook. Finally, if you've got a few dollars and you'd like to provide some financial support to the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash Podcast. Alternatively, you can also support the show at subscribestar.com. You can find us there at Relevant History. And for everything else, including links to interviews and my blog, which may or may not ever get updated, once again, Dan Toller Podcast, Dan T O L E R Podcast.com. Thanks for listening.